Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Pia. Great to see you again. It's been a long time. Um, I reckon yeah. it's probably been 15 or 16 years. Has it really been that long? Yeah. 2005, I came to Hong Kong when we uh -huh. met each other. And um, it was a very wonderful experience I had in Hong Kong. And it taught me so much. And um, yeah, I experienced many amazing things whilst I was there. It was a magical time yeah and i met you of course and why is it taking me so long to get you on my podcast <laughs> <laughs> good question um i i i think i just um we're connected on linkedin and suddenly i yes. saw I, I didn't realize you had a podcast and then suddenly it's like here's my latest podcast and i was like well done michael this is cool i've got to explore this and, and <laughs> I guess I guess you probably have people lining up to be on your wonderful podcast. So anyway, here we are today. So I guess today is the perfect day for us to record. Definitely the perfect day. And what where we're going to get started is uh, I, we want to hear your story from from the start. So you know where were you born? Have you mm. moved around? Your education um and and then we'll get to current day and what you're up to so you're going to do most of the speaking if i hear something interesting i might interrupt and and <laughs> ask deeper questions yeah so over to you pia fantastic good thing is i quite like to talk myself so it's <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> um yeah so i'm originally from norway i was born and partly raised in norway and um, yeah, we're very nationalistic there. However, my I remember one day, you know, my grandfather used to have one, one of these globes that turns on its axis. That was one of their decorations in the, in the house. And my dad said, you know, Pia and Peter, my brother, we're gonna move. And so I went, oh, and you know, I asked, is it this neighborhood is that? And then I said, let's go to your granddad's glo globe. And then they right. went, Meh. and he showed me this place and it was in the Middle East. So yeah. we were moving, my dad had got a job. My mom and dad went to check it out to see if it would be okay. But we went all the way from Norway to the United Arab Emirates. And you can imagine, um, a little Norwegian girl, of course, my brother, different story, but in that type of culture, being with this kind of very light skin color, blue eyes, very yes. white hair, it was it was um, not the easiest place for me to be. No. However, um, you know, our, our stay there was very much like two poles. It was like this, whoa, the, the world had just opened up. I was 11 years old and the world just opened it was so there was every nationality under the sun one of my best friends was from pakistan mm. and it was just, it was very rich in in diversity and and there was no like line in the sand between who gets to hang out with who it was very much a sort of hot pot of of people from all over the world intermingling and and kind of creating little families as they were all we were all not from there and nice. at the other at the other end it is and this was the early 80s and it was it was quite a challenge for me as a as a young you know budding into my teenage years living in in probably the most extreme uh extreme extremely different culture to where i came from in scandinavia yes but but of course i wouldn't be without it because i think at some point i thought to myself if i can survive here meaning if i can live in such a vastly different and often extremely challenging place i can yeah. probably live anywhere yes it kind of set me up with quite a bit of resilience um but of course also this very open mind 
And mm. so that even when we did go back to Norway, I, I, um, I think I stayed in Norway for a couple of years and then I headed off to the States to be an exchange student. Right. So then I was there for a year, came back to Norway and, um, I guess I was in Norway another couple of years, three years, and then I went to the UK to study. So, so that, that initial stint in the Middle East just totally opened and, and gave me this thirst for, for exploring and traveling and, and learning because I could see yes. the, the, the learning that's available in just interacting with people that are not like me. Because yeah. I also come from a very small town in Norway. There's like now 65,000 people. And, mm. and you don't necessarily bump into too many very different people there, right? And so yeah. now, by, by the time I went to uni, which I think I was 20, I had already, you know, seen a lot and experienced a lot and, and especially learning from, from the, yeah. the, the richness of other cultures. And the reason why I chose the UK to study was because my mother was, uh, was, uh, was English. Oh. And although my brother went to the States to, to uni, I just thought, you know, I should go somewhere where a big part of me belongs and, and right. I, I is a big part of me. So, and I remember my mom said, you know, just before I left, she said, don't forget you're half English. And I kind of <laughs> just looked at her, have you seen my passport recently? Because I was convinced that I was very Norwegian. Right. And interestingly, as I then arrived in Manchester, which is was my first stop in the UK, I I realized that I wasn't like all the other Norwegian international students. I wasn't right. like them and I wasn't like the Brits. I was something in between. Yes. So my mom yeah. was actually totally right in just remember there's a lot of you that's not Norwegian and 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 that I think that's probably a really big gift um, to have this kind of mix. And of course, when I was in the UK for, for five years, I got to really get into the culture and, and spend more time with family that, that are still based in the, in the UK. So yeah. by the time I finished uni, I had, I'd already quite a few years under my belt living in different continents. And, uh, but I still, you know, Norway is still essentially home and of course what what I what, where I most relate to yeah but it's it's interesting because it's similar for me what you're describing you know having traveled and lived as a young person in different locations it does give you a totally different perspective on the rest of the world doesn't it mm. um, you don't become so insular and I think it just opens your mind and, and, you know, you, you have a thirst for exploring more as well, which obviously is what you did. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And then, and then, um, the big piece was after university, one of my friends in, in uni, she had grown up in Hong Kong. She was a British, British girl, but she had spent. I think maybe six years part of growing up in Hong Kong. And she yeah. kept on hounding me. She's like, come visit, come visit. I'm just like, come where? <laughs> where on earth would I go somewhere like Hong Kong? It, it was so foreign to me. Yes. Even if I had seen quite a bit of the world by the, by this point, but, but um, what, what ended up happening was that there was, a friend of my brother's, he's three years older than me. And there was this, from I was very young, maybe nine, I would go and watch my brother play football. Yeah. And he had a friend that I, I think I will love him till the day I die. One of those. <laughs> I had this huge crush on yeah. this wonderful boy. And after uni, it looked like maybe the two of us might be getting together. It was, I couldn't believe it. It was like a dream come true until it didn't happen. Yes. <laughs> and I, I look back at this and at the time I just thought this was, this was such a big dream come true. But what this led me to was to say, well, that's it then. I'm gonna go visit Kathy in Hong Kong. And that's how I actually decided to book a ticket and wow. go to Hong Kong. 
not because I had some grand plans, but because my heart was broken and I'm just, but I was going to go visit like these days, you know, well, before COVID, um, every after uni, everyone goes traveling, backpacking. And I decided, okay, I'll just do that in Hong Kong. Yes. And I never left. Wow. And I have now officially spent half my life in Hong Kong. <laughs> Which was just, it was, I mean, I, I still say it and it's just mind boggling to me because that's 25 years. That's just because of that time. boy, he has a lot to answer for. <laughs> he certainly does. I should, I should write to him and say, thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because oh, wow. life would have taken a very different turn. And that reminds me, did you ever watch that movie called Sliding Doors? Yes, I think I did. Yes. I just thought it was a really clever story of how, you know, if you take this, this decision, yes. you, your life goes in that direction. If you take that decision, it will go in a totally different direction. And yeah. I kind of seem like had that continued, I would never have gone east for sure. No. And, and what, you know, living, you know, go, like I said at the beginning, living in Abu Dhabi, I could live anywhere after that. And that yes. was very true. Arriving in Hong Kong, it just, although it's like a little bit, bit scary, of course, going anywhere new, but, but it, as you know, because you've been, you've been, uh, been in Hong Kong, it's very vibrant. And, and I guess I wouldn't really call Norway so vibrant. It's, it's full of many wonderful things, but just kind of this energy that Hong Kong offers is, for me, it was just, it was like an elixir, you know, it was so, so exciting to me to arrive there yes. and meet all these people that had been to places, done things that mm, were mm. so exciting. Mm. And that was very inspiring because I'm just a little girl from Norway. I had no particular plans of doing anything other than just do what everybody else does, you know. Uh, you maybe go to uni, then you finish uni, you get a job, you meet somebody, you get married, have kids. That yes. journey I didn't take. Instead, this whole other world opened, which I'm very grateful for. So, so how how did it work in terms of immigration and things? Yeah. You know, how did you just kind of go from Norway to Hong Kong? I mean, what was the point? I'm really interested to know. You, you kind of ran away from this boy to go to Hong Kong. Uh, that's an interesting concept in terms of aversion. But you got to Hong Kong like backpacking almost and then you stayed. But when was the point? How long did it take that when you decided I'm staying here and I'm going to find a job? and I'm going to get a new passport or I'm going to immigrate or how did all that happen? I think, I mean, it was fairly early because I wasn't, I was, my idea was two to three months. Yeah. So it would, it would definitely be within the first two months. And, and because my, my friend Kathy and I had both studied interior design in uni and right. she, she was working there and I thought, well, you know, I could give it a try. The the at the time, Hong Kong was still a British colony. Yes, it's that long yeah. ago. So so that's it, right. Yeah, it's um, it's coming up to twenty three years ago that that Hong Kong went back to China. But at the yeah. time, if you were British, it was very easy. And of course, I'm not British. No. So i had a lot of friends that were from the uk and they simply just got a job you would get you would see a lot of people for example straight out of uni work in bars and restaurants because or maybe yes. they were packing but in my case i still needed a a, a working visa and and in hong kong it's kind of catch-22 because you can't get a job if you don't have a visa and you won't get a visa if you can't get, if you don't have a job yeah. so a lot of the time for people like me we kind of have to be a bit sneaky about it so I was a bit sneaky. Well, the company that I finally got a job with, we had to be a bit sneaky about it. And yeah. and and then they so they have to so-called sponsor me to to give me a working visa. Right. So that um so that 
uh, you have to reapply as you change jobs. And I think it's been about 20 years now since I since I had another company sponsor me because since th since then I haven't had a job. But yes. but that process can be quite tricky. And I think probably more so now you have to show a few more kind of diplomas and, and skills um, that's different to what's available there to to be able to to get a visa yeah but but they they do make it accessible right for, for people to come there so you can arrive on a tourist visa for three months and then in that period you can figure out what you what you want to do yeah yeah oh great but it can so, be pretty yeah so uh, the thing is you you over came some of those things so the the draw to stay there was quite strong for you to have to deal with all of those paperwork things because it can be like daunting to kind of go because how old were you when you got there i was 25 yeah straight so, out of uni yeah straight out of uni so it can be a bit daunting can't it i mean it was very daunting because you know what I my degree prepared me for nothing. Yeah, my degree was a nice five years of enjoying Manchester and Edinburgh and student life. Yes, um, you know, like I said, I I trained as an interior designer and and in fact that was all wrong from the start. Mm. I'm kind of backtracking a little bit now, but I from when i was about a teenager i was very very fascinated by psychology about how we work about right. this um goings on in the mind and the heart and yeah. and in norway i remember at the time it's like well for you to become a psychologist it would take seven years and i'm like i'm not doing seven years of course, in retrospect, you know, I've done so much more since then in terms of educating myself post my degree. But yes, but then out of the blue, I just decided, oh, I'm going to do interior design. And and I already knew it, probably with, by the second year at uni that I didn't even want to do that. But I was so stubborn. And I think there was something like I I learned to be a follower of rules were very rules based in my family. So I thought, well, I've started this thing now, I've got to finish it. Yes. Rather than this is not what I want. I'm gonna quit and do what I want. Yeah. And for anybody listening, this is not a good strategy. I would say if you have the inclination that whatever's going on in your life isn't working, then that's a really good sign that it's not working and it's time to look at how can I make it work or change it. And this is what I didn't do. I was so rigid in the, I've started this, so I've got to finish. So, so, um, so I did work in, uh, I did get a few jobs, um, yes. but I, but I did work inside of the interior design field for a number of years until I started slowly kind of looking for opportunities to, to move out of that field because it, I not only was I not good at it, but it just wasn't my thing. No. And I suppose because of the nature of my particular degree, it was very artistic, less practical, less kind of implementable. I think I just made up a word. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I know a dear, dear friend who was at a different uni in Edinburgh uh, to what I was, she came really equipped and she happens to live in Hong Kong. She came equipped really with practical, uh, tools that she could really use in the the in the world, yeah. whereas my degree wasn't very applicable that way. So it it felt even harder. And I think for me, I was always kind of like putting on a brave face and 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 pretending like I had it handled. Where most of the time, I really did not have it handled. And I no. I felt like I was just treading on the on the top of the surface. I'm this like this and on the bottom I'm like oh, I've no idea what I'm doing and and mm, uh, mm. that was tricky because there were certain you know when you go to like metropolis like Hong Kong we've got like over seven million people there's quite a lot of competition of course for the jobs and when you finally get the jobs it's like you've got to prove yourself and 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 that was not so easy for me I no. struggled yeah oh wow so but you did 
try and implement what you'd learned with those companies and what I, how I long did. did you do that for probably i'd say the first between four and five years okay and and um i did have a little bit of a break from hong kong i thought we had i thought it was time to break up after about four years right we broke up but i actually really missed it Gosh. i went to london for about a year hated it yeah mostly because you've got to be oh my god you've got to be really rich to live in london and i was dirt poor yeah so so i went back to hong kong and that was really kind of a a, a good point to say okay well how can i i shift and um around this time i had also gone through a really difficult time um i mean i wasn't diagnosed with anything but i would say that i probably went through a depression at that time when i was living in london yeah. and uh and by the time i then returned to hong kong i finally after about a year decided to get some support for this very dark period of my life and that's when i started getting getting counseling yeah. and uh, what i'm super grateful for this till this day was that there's there's one or two uh, charities in hong kong that will let you pay on like a scale depending on what your salary is Wow. So that actually gave me the opportunity to actually go and get counseling, which was just a revelation to me. Yeah. And and just actually before I'd left uh, London, I did this wonderful, wonderful at the time workshop that a, a beautiful friend of mine in, in London introduced me to called Landmark Education and, and uh, oh, the yes. program called Landmark Forum. And I had yeah. done no inner work before, but I'd seen her go through and the kind of changes that she had implemented and bless her because i was so dirt poor in london she said to me you know what if you want to do this program she was very committed and she said i'll pay for you and you can pay me back mm -hmm. and i still to this day now i get like goosebumps because that was that was really a turning point for me to open up to the fact that you know there's some there's some things inside that are that I've been holding on to. There's some things yeah. inside that are are very shaky and I need some support. I need to be able to find some words and find ways to to live a life where where I don't fall into like this deep, dark night of the soul. Yes. And that was thank you, Pippa, for kind of introducing me and being that wonderful friend that could do something like that for me when I really needed it. And so just though that last little period in London, I was introduced to meditation through um, a wonderful um, Indian organization called Brahma Kumaris. They do yes. like in, in London, in Wilsdon in London, they do free positive thinking courses. And I went mm -hmm. there because of how deeply distressed I felt inside. I, you know, I was reading books, but also like, what else can I do? Because yeah. I felt super, super um, desperate. And so then when I went back to Hong Kong and started getting counseling, the reason why I brought all this up is because that brought me to see that, wow, this is an arena like to support people like this is, wow, it brings me way back to my teens when this yeah. whole hunger to understand myself and understand how we function was, was I was reminded and kind of reignited and um and then i also remember at brahma kumaris in hong kong because then i found them in hong kong i started sometimes helping them there um at this time i wasn't working so i met a wonderful indian coach and i thought wow coaching is amazing next thing you know i i trained as a coach yes and uh and at the same time 20 years ago till this day been very committed to my therapeutic journey through the journey of coming back to my original self if i can say it that because another thing i realized was that i i wasn't really living from my authentic self i'd learn to kind of wear a mask of what i thought was acceptable in society yes. and so learning the skills of coaching was the first step but then parallel to that I was learning and going through my own journey, but also learning therapeutic modalities 
that first of all, it started by me just wanting to help myself. But then now, of course, it just becomes next to me is my big toolbox. And there are a great deal of tools in my toolbox because of the decisions I've made to make this probably the biggest priority in my life yes. to be healthy on the inside. And that's what, what kind of it, it was ignited in London. And, and then it just continued in, in continued. Kong, and then it became my profession. Wow. Okay. So it's really interesting, isn't it? Because when you, it sounds like you discovered at some point that you needed to do some work on yourself. You then teachers showed up to help you with that. And then you have become the teacher <laughs> now as well, yeah. which is just wonderful, isn't it? It's, it's amazing that once you discover certain things and because all the training is, is actually helping you to begin with, because any training that I've ever been on, you know, whether it's wellness coaching or whatever that I've done in the past, you've got to do it first in order to really mm -hmm. understand it before you can yeah. share that gift with other people. And that's, of course, what you did. You worked on yourself first and then you have more empathy for an understanding for people that mm -hmm. you're helping today. Yeah. Um, and in addition to that, I would say that there's something about if you're my client, I'm not going to ask you to do something that I haven't done myself. So there's yes. a there's a congruency in the who I am being in my life as a whole with what I also do as a profession. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that and th this is I'm certainly some of the things that I'm studying apart from the work that I do, but you know I'm on this ongoing personal development journey still you know mm. once i discovered it you just can't let it go because it just you remain curious don't you in terms of what goes on inside of you and and you kind of awareness okay so so i'm really interested now how did you make all of that pay because you, you mentioned London. I was too poor to live in London. I'm going back to Hong Kong. You know, you had the landmark forum paid for. You then discovered other things in Hong Kong. But Hong Kong isn't that cheap to live in either. So how did you make things pay? You know, in the in the early days of my coaching practice, I would be doing other things on the side. I would do little yeah. projects and because I'd done quite a lot of event planning and management, I could often do like a, a project around a, a, like I used to every year do something called the Forbes Global CEO Conference. Huge thing with lots of big wigs from all of those. You can imagine it was Forbes magazine. Yes. Uh, so things like that, I would kind of sniff out and go, OK, great. And that would would um, supplement what I was doing, but but one of the things that I also uh, noticed very early was that I really enjoyed group, group, the energy of a group. So yeah. so when it's just a one on one in interaction, that's wonderful. But I really liked like group trainings, workshops, group coaching. And so when I when I really kind of saw that mm, that's something I really want to get into, mm. I I went out to look for opportunities and there um and i don't know if you know this about hong kong but in hong kong one of the things that i love is that if let's say you and i meet and and let's say you you have a coaching in a company and you, you're looking for a coach and you and i just meet and we really get on and you really like my style or you like you like my energy and you're like hey pia would you would you like to be one of my coaches you never saw a diploma. You never got a coaching session from me. Mm. Very often, it's face value that 
that shows up in Hong Kong or if it comes from a recommendation. And this is one thing I really love because when you can, um, the opportunities to come my way has come my way that way. Like yes. I started my uh, doing training through a company that two old friends had uh, started and it was a team building company. Right. And we were all friends and it was just like, hey, would you like to be involved in this? And that's where I really learned the nuts and bolts of facilitating. And then right. through that, one of the women that was also a facilitator with them, she said, hey, um, I, I uh, trained for this company and they're, they need more people. Would you like an introduction? And, and till this day, I still work for that company. Um, and then finally, there was one, uh, one guy who happens to live on the same little island that I do in Hong Kong. He um, was doing trainings for very big banks and organizations. And I just kind of put my hand up and go, hey, do you need any more people? So often <laughs> for me, it was a matter of like either knowing the right people or being on uh, being in the right place at the right time, because that last question led me on a journey of, let's say, four years of very full on uh, traveling all over Asia, delivering trainings to anything from India and Sri Lanka to the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia. The list goes on. Wow. Uh, because of just kind of that question, like looking for opportunities yeah. and, the, and, and, and the trainings and the, the group coaching, they go really hand in hand, of course, with then the individual coaching work. So I do both. I, 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 uh, I still do the, the gigs through, through companies that yeah. uh, need training facilitations. And then I also do my individual clients as well. Same time. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, that's really clear. I really understand that. And um, what you described there, you were, and obviously you were in the right place to do that, because I do understand, you know, Hong Kong, from that point of view, you were doing some extremely useful networking. And, you know, she said, you know, putting your hand up going, hey, do you need somebody to do that? <laughs> um, I can help with that, which is, yeah. And that's that's a big thing, isn't it? It's networking is really, really important in, especially with us small businesses mm. to, to get your name out there. And, you know, like, because we're like freelancers, aren't we, uh, effectively? Yeah. And, and that's and that's the way to to find new clients or to keep new existing clients is just keep networking okay so you kind of now set up um you you did you create your own company in that process yes i did i mean that was quite a project right because I trained as a coach like 19 years ago. Yeah. Nobody had any idea what coaching was. No. And so um, in Hong Kong, you need to be a, a working taxpayer for seven years and then you can become a permanent resident. Right. Now, I had, I set up a company because nobody's going to hire a coach. So I set up my own company, not because I'm some grand entrepreneur. It's, it was a practical decision. Yes. And it got to a point where they were once once I once I applied, I gave paperwork size of this, you know, to to explain what coaching was. Mm. I was so creative and getting people to getting friends to write me references to say, if you give her a, a, a visa, then we might consider working with her. We, I need a test. It was a huge project. Wow. But it was the only possibility for me. So again, I I have been very creative. And in fact, I think in general in Hong Kong, people are have to be creative because it's the ultimate capital estate. You know, yeah. nobody there is gonna pay you your 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 dole money if you don't have a job. So people yeah. have to be creative in the way that they create their 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 jobs. Mm. And um so after handing in all those 
all that all those papers I finally got got uh, to sponsor myself. But then after a few years, because I still needed to do the full seven years as a taxpayer to get my permanent residency, they started mm. questioning me. Why aren't you hiring local people? And it was just me. I didn't need to hire anybody. Yeah. And it was really touch and go at one point until again, this woman at the Inland Revenue Department, she had been so difficult and challenging. And basically what happened is that I needed to apply for another year of my visa. I had to apply every year, but it was just three months until I was going to get my permanent residency. Oh, and you know, I it really wasn't looking good for me. And then suddenly she turned around and she said, I will give you a three month extension. <gasps> and I mean, it was like for somebody who had been so difficult, she suddenly, my God, she's actually an angel because this <laughs> was my break. This is what I needed. So finally, then I was able to, to become a, a permanent resident. And now there, nobody's going to ask me any questions about my work they just make sure, I just have to make sure I pay my taxes. So that was another it, it, it kind of felt like I said to myself, if I'm not meant to stay here any longer, then they're going to give me a no and I'm going to have to leave. Mm. But mm. they gave me a yes. So I thought, I guess I'm I guess I'm meant to stay here a little bit longer. Brilliant. And and, uh, you know, still, I, I, I can't remember which year this was now, but it, it I certainly haven't looked back. I mean, the the abilities in this work that I've done to for lots of traveling for for working with different cultures is is certainly really, really fun for me. And um, India is um, is my favorite country. And and in some of the companies that I work with, when there's some work coming up in India, they're like, OK, let's send Pia. She loves it there. And <laughs> uh, and it just kind of at the end of the day, I think more than anything, I've just tried to be as as curious about what else I can do to make this work for myself. Curiosity is a really, really big quality of mine. And in fact, one of my values is just stay curious. Yes. That's both with my inner work that I've been doing for over 20 years, but also about opportunities and and relationships and and conversations like this to be curious. Yeah. And then also to, to, despite maybe feeling, feeling nervous, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah. Like, I don't think that anything I've ever done has been, oh, I'm so fearless. It's more about, I need to do this. I need to take some of these steps. I, I can't be sitting, playing small the whole time. And of course, part of my inner journey of all that yeah. inner work that I've done has helped me to to build a little, that kind of confidence where I can, I can stick my neck out a little bit and, and, um, and be, be a little bit more fearless. Most of the time the fear is there, but I do it anyway. Yes. And that's also one thing I've really learned about living in Hong Kong, because again, they've, they've, they're, they're the ultimate entrepreneurs there. Yeah. They really just are creative and, and, like I said earlier, there's this, this kind of yes culture that I think like now when we record this, I'm in, in Berlin and here it's it's almost like the direct opposite. So yep. I feel like part of my journey as an entrepreneur has been greatly supported by living in Hong Kong because of just the entrepreneurial spirit and their willingness to just like, I'm going to do what it takes. And so yep. that's one of the things I've kind of learned from living in that particular city. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, great. That's that that kind of brings us up to date, right? To where you are today. Um mm. so tell us then, because we wanna have a chat about the book, which I can see behind you there, or beside you. And <laughs> um tell us about a little bit more detail about the work that you now do for people. So mm -hmm. I know there are two parts. I don't mind you covering both. So feel free. Um, you know, you do your team facilitation, leadership stuff, and then the kind of one to one coaching. Yeah. Um, so share share with our listeners exactly what you do today. Sure. 
So with with the the work with companies and groups, I mean, there's I wear so many hats, but but let, let's call it the corporate work. Yes, um, that's that's actually been a wonderful. I mean, I started with corporate work, you know, uh, 15, 16 years ago, perhaps, but but it's been a wonderful way to learn and make money at the same time. Yes. Uh, so so coming into teaching about leadership, I was like. Oh, am I really am I really equipped to teach about leadership? But it, it started in a quite a subtle way, and it built itself up. So, I would say my speciality in that area is actually communication and presentation skills, and it's right. something that I've been teaching for a great many years. And what I love about that it's that it's totally transferable. It doesn't matter what you do, who you are. That is a skill that you really need to have. Yes, and and I I love teaching that, and and of course it also requires a lot of um, self awareness because often people don't notice their own behaviors, and I suppose as I move then further into leadership, often this word awareness comes back in again because mm -hmm. the awareness of who am I being? It's all very well when there's a problem going on to to point sideways or often upstairs right it's because of the guys upstairs yes but the leadership work that i've had the pleasure and and privilege of doing for many years now is often about gaining awareness about personal responsibility and i often the the, the kind of leadership that i'm much more interested in is is inner leadership it's yes. like yeah sure you can tell all these people what to do but who are you being to inspire these people to follow suit to do yes. and want to be like you. And that's really what um, what really interests me. And that again comes back to this. I earlier in our conversation created a parallel path here, by the way, and this is my yes. inner journey path. So yes. that has informed so many things, including how I then work with these leaders and yeah. executives that that to, to, to get curious and create more awareness about who they need to be in order to lead. And then, of course, we teach some practical tools along the way. Um, what I am coming back to my inner work, what I am super, super passionate about, however, is really going deep. And so I do a few different from a group perspective. I do um, I am a, a, what's called a learning love teacher. And right. also I facilitate a process called path of love. And the latter is actually a very intense seven day process where you really go deep into your, your inner world to, to see what are all those things that you've been holding on to that actually keep you small or keep you in fear. And so yes. for seven days, we participants are, are deeply into their, their darkest stuff, their most yeah. painful stuff. And we, mm. we support them to work through and express. A lot of that is about let's express those things that we never had the chance to express often when those challenges arose, which would be in childhood. And the learning, learning love work is also very much coming back into in time for um, and being informed about what is it that what is it that happened when we were children that is unhealed unresolved and we work through that so so yeah. those bits are uh, those that kind of work really excites me because it really comes back to to vulnerability and and personal truth mm. personal truth and so when i work individually with people now i'm cherry picking what tools work at at a specific you know with a specific client so although i call it coaching i could be using counseling because i'm a holistic counselor i can be using some of the tools i have from the inner child work or or i also do something called biodynamic breath work and trauma release which is a trauma informed type of breath work and right. i might bring some of those tools in so i it's it's a very holistic piece of uh, toolbox i would say but what's very important in anything i do is meditation 
And a, a meditation really re helps you to gain that inner awareness. Yes. Meditation and also bringing the body in, allowing the body to have a key part in, in the work that we do in that. And what you'll find is that when you start getting connected, more connected with the body, and of course we, education wise, we learn to function from here up. Yes. And what I'm saying is that we need to include the whole body because the body and the, and the language of the senses can actually give us a lot of cues to what's going on and how we can then support, how I can support somebody and yeah. how my, that particular client could also support themselves. So, so I actually have, um, I have a system that I use that and I, I call it your inner compass. And that's really, it's a total shift from being looking outwards for cues about how to live your life. Hmm. Cause of course in education, we look outwards, they tell us what to do and we do it. And yeah. even with relationships and, and our, the, our communities that we belong to, it could be education, it could be religion, whatever that we've, we're taught yeah. overtly or covertly how to be decent human beings. But in the, in the journey, many of us, we lose sight of what's really true for us because, yeah. and I like to kind of mention that, you know, we all are given a unique fingerprint for a reason because we are totally unique. Yeah. And so, so, uh, part of the the inner compass is to to we're, we're looking at things like like your needs looking at things like personal boundaries which i'd say all my or the majority of my clients over the years do not have good personal boundaries and that causes all sorts of problems and yes. so the inner compass are different tools that we we work with in order for ha huh, all the knowledge and wisdom I need is actually inside of me. That's really, the, that's the core of my work actually, is mm. to go in and to be curious about what's there. And part of that, of course, is having the courage to say, you know, this journey might not be, you know, it's not linear. It's the journey yeah. often looks like this, but yes. if you're willing, the, the, the pot of gold at the end of that, is always worth it because like the inner peace the the relationship that you that i get with myself because now i actually listen to the 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 cues of what's important to me and and what's okay and what isn't mm. it's so relaxing as well yes. so that's really at the core of my work is is coming back to you that unique soul that nobody else has this fingerprint mm. Wow, there's a lot there. Um, I mean, clearly you have studied so many different things in coming up with your own formula to help people. Yeah. And again, it's your unique formula. It's not anybody else's. And, you know, having like a toolkit, toolbox or whatever, or being able to grab these things out sometimes must be quite difficult as well. Do you ever get confused to say, oh, I need the breath work tool today for this person, or I need, you know, the the kind of love thing that you mentioned, uh, or I need something else. Um, do you ever get confused which one to pick? Not really. You know, at the at the end of the day, when an individual comes to me, they're pretty much the ones that are doing the work. Right. You know, I, of course, you know, I am using my tools to support them on their journey. Yes. But I would say that that now, after all these years, it. I would say the 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 inner cues of what's to come next comes quite naturally yeah. and in those moments in those moments when maybe i'm like oh what's what's the next question to ask a, a a good question is always just coming back to the client yes. and and um and and bringing the attention back to them so instead of me going oh what's the best way to go it's um and and i might just say 
So what's, go what's, uh, what's going on for you right now? What's alive in you right now? As I say that, as you shared, uh, sh say more about that. Yeah. Like that, that, that's a very easy coaching question because like often people need to delve a little bit deeper into whatever they're sharing. So when I, so if, if in, in doubt, I do have some, some easy questions to bring it back to the client. Cause at the end of the day, it's all about them anyway. Yes. Um, and, and one thing I didn't mention, but the, the, the role of a coach, counselor, therapist, whatever you want to call it. The biggest tool in my toolbox is to hold space or hold presence. Yeah. And by that is that when you and I are having a session, I'm not busy thinking about lunch. I'm not busy worrying about where I need to take you. I am only totally present here and now with you. Right. And, and that might sound simplistic, but a client feels that it feels that yeah. creates safety. It creates like, wow, this space is for me. I can really take up all the space I need. And that's another thing that from childhood, many of us, we weren't allowed to take up space. So just my role mm. of giving people space to explore what's happening for them is, is actually a, a technique in itself, but mm. that, and I've seen this again and again, if all I'm being, is present and listening attentively to you. So much magic can happen for for a client's uh, inner work. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, and thank you for sharing that. Um, it's it's how do people decide? I need help, and how do they? you know, how do they even like, I mean, not hopefully people will have heard you and they will be contacting you if they need help, but how do they know they need help and how do they know, how do people even know where to go yeah. or does it just happen that they get guided where to go? <laughs> do you know what I mean? I totally know what you mean. And, and the, just to comment briefly on the guided, mm. there certainly are people, of course, that are guided, but often we, we, I would say the majority of the time, it's because something that hasn't been working in your life for a while has, has kind of hit a wall or, or come to an head yeah. where, you know, I've been holding on for this for a while, but now it's just too much. Yeah. So I, I would say that in our achievement world that we're living in, you know, we're all, we're all fine. Yeah. We're all fine. And we're all striving to achieve. Like, yeah. I remember like this wonderful prime minister in New Zealand. I think she said last year that everything cannot be focused on. It, it can't, we can't always push for growth, for growth, for growth. And, and I loved how she said that because that yeah. most of us, the reason why people are working over time and stressed out is because so much is required yes. of people in jobs these days. Often you're working at one and a half jobs. There's not enough people on your team. And so, and so we, we hold it and we hold it. We've got to just, you know, suck it up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's so unhealthy. It's yeah. th th this whole thing that, that we've got to squeeze the most out of people in organizations. It's so incredibly healthy, but of course it comes from this pressure of, we need to grow at all cost. We need yeah. to increase, you know, our, our, you know, the, 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 the shareholders of the, the, the company we need to, we're, we're, we're working for them. And so yeah. I, I say, I, I'm, I'm digressing a bit, but at the end of the day, people are holding and holding so much. And, and that's also why I think that a lot of people kind of get to this, like I did get to this dark night of the soul where, where they really hit a wall. Yeah. Or um, very often in my experience, the troubles that people then finally decide to, to come is because there are problems in relating mm. in their relationships. Mm. 
and and um and those are for most of us relationships are so important right mm. be it mm. with our, our spouses partners or family members children colleagues but but that is where it really starts getting tricky when 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 our relating isn't working mm. and and um but most importantly it could be either you you have physical symptoms like yeah. i have physical pain because i have a hold a lot of tension in my body yes and and there for example um the the biodynamic breathwork and trauma release that i do we're often like the work that we're doing is to release some of that tension and trauma that sits in the body yes um it could be sleep sleeplessness that shows up yeah but it could be just an niggling i'm not happy is this all mm. that there is yes probably you know at the end of the day that's just like you know what like I, i i'm working day in day out i'm kind of going through the motions and i'm just not happy is this all that there is mm. and and that that is a good cue to go you know what something is definitely needing some attention yes. and it might not be be you know the you know oh wow you're suffering from a depression or or having some some big diagnosis but the fact is that you know there is no nothing better for you to invest in but yourself mm. now that could be self education it could be your health your physical health you you mentioned before we pressed record that you like to go cycling in the in the forest close to where you live like that yeah. like there's many ways to invest in yourself like the car we need to take it for an mot every year and all these things that we do do to take care of our our physical space but yes. we haven't learned to say we've got to also do our inner mot we've yeah. got to make sure that this inner part is healthy as well and that's where um people often then will 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 seek somebody out like me like a coach it's a little bit easier i think to say oh i'm having a coach rather than i have a counselor or a therapist yes. but of course everyone i work with it's it's confidential anyway you know it's yeah most importantly to create like a, a a safe space for people to feel safe to when, when or if some difficult feelings come up then they know that this will stay here brilliant thank you for that explanation because i think it really helps people especially seeing as we're recording this in may 2021 and you know which has been through an amazing year of uh, of interesting developments and there will be lots of people i believe asking the question about is there all you know is this it because they've perhaps had time away from their jobs you know they've been furloughed and they've had to be at home and then contemplating going back at some point and thinking do i really want to go back to where i was sure. you know um so maybe it's been a gift but again you know people need some support and guidance okay so tell us about your book uh she rises i can't see what it says underneath she rises for tomorrow tomorrow me... yeah thank you bring it right up close and personal yeah this is uh, this is a baby that was born during covid great i didn't think i would be giving birth to anything at the beginning <laughs> of last year but i gave birth to this and uh, again it was just one of those like i mentioned earlier like one of those opportunities that i got curious about and yes. so i asked a few more questions and the next thing i knew i was in this book so it's these are not all my words i am one okay. of the authors in here right. and um and when the opportunity came up i thought well what do i have to say <laughs> Hello, that. and then when i finally got the physical book and and read my chapter i thought well that's very short so so i went from i don't have anything to say well i have a lot more to say so yes you know these collaborative books are 
are a, a great tool to become become an author yes. and and of course people pay attention to authors mm. like wow this person has a few more things to say yes. but um it the invitation was to uh, female entrepreneurs talking about challenges that we have faced and overcome yes. almost like the hero's journey love it and, which is yeah the basis right? for all storytelling yeah of course you, you <laughs> you're a storyteller yes. of course and and um and for me the the i didn't one of the things i didn't um didn't mention in this interview but but you know my um my mum also suffered from well not also she suffered from depression yes uh, in and out of depression her whole life and medication and all this stuff and and as you can imagine you know our mothers are our most important relationship in our in our life yes. we had that our relationship to her started at conception yes that's the longest relationship so of course um having a mom that that was was um lived with so many challenges for so many years that was really um that's really big my been my biggest p hurdle or the biggest piece of work that i've had to work through yes. and so uh so the journey with her illness and also her death really i talk about it in this book and and I remember when I finally it finally got published, then I got a little bit scared, not scared, but just nervous, like, wow, this is this is a very intimate and open sharing in the book. But at the end of the day, I think because I grew up with the particular mother I grew up with, and that, that's of course I think why I also got interest in psychology so early on in my life in my teens. Yes. It's more important than for me. To also i can be the voice of people that suffer mm. and i can be also then the voice of saying well i've also suffered with my own things but in addition to that coming um you know having certain um you know having a dysfunctional family mm. uh, and, and what that brought and um, what challenges those brought me and um and so in fact i i also speak about my mother's suicide in this book and mm. uh, in fact now i don't think about it it's like this is an important conversation for people to read even if they will never have this experience but no. to see that the regular people like you and i we we experience pain and loss in our life mm. so for people that are currently experiencing loss or pain that they wow they might read something like this and go wow i'm not alone i mean mm. i look at Tia and she looks like she's got it all together i look like michael he's so amazing but then to also say, well, yeah, that's all true. And there's also this whole other thing there that, and I think that the importance of allowing people to see that, you know, they're not alone is yes. perhaps the first step in somebody, if they're really challenging or in pain to then see, ah, maybe I can, I can ask for support. Maybe I can um, find ways to find more inner peace, to find more mm. ways that I can feel really touch happiness in my life and yeah. not just like fleeting moments, but I can actually say, oh, now I found a way to to. Yeah, find that happiness in my life. And so I suppose that's why I decided to go take that tack in yes. my hero's journey, because it in this particular relationship informs everything in my life. Mm. And and if only just one person reads it and goes, either I'm not going to take that route or I'm going to I'm going to ask for help because I need it. That yeah. will be a wonderful. But all in all, I think just more and more people are choosing the entrepreneurial journey. Yes. And, you know, why take the route of I'm just going to do the whole slug on my own? Mm. You know, I, I for example, I used to. Uh, one of the opportunities that I created uh, many moons ago was I was invited to work on a team with um, success strategist Anthony Robbins, yes. Big Tony, right? And yeah. and that you know I was I was actually listening to him yesterday, mm. and he was and and he preaches again and again. He says, 
why go the long route when you can do the short route and learn from other people? Mm. So you yeah. can learn from other entrepreneurs here, or you can pick up books, whatever interests you or whatever challenge you are having, mm. pick up a book and you read that book. You don't have to go through the 20 years of, let's say my experience and the, the work I've done. You don't have to do that. Yes. And I think that is a really key thing now as an entrepreneur, as somebody who's who really has wisdom and knowledge to share, but then there's all also other people that have been there and gone there before you that you can then piggyback on them. So it doesn't have to necessarily take you 20 years, but maybe a week to read a book, then to implement or whatever that is. And I suppose yeah. that's part of the, the reason why this book was created. And if anybody's interested in reading it, it's super important that you choose the one with my name because there's multiple authors and we all get our name on the front. So that's oh, a that's a nice touch. That's a nice touch. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't I love it? That. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Fantastic, Pia. Um I I love a conversation. Well, I could ask you more questions and, and get more stories out of you, I'm sure. And I suppose what you're saying, this is why this podcast exists as well is to help you know other you know young people middle-aged people retired people doesn't matter to be inspired to become mm -hmm. entrepreneurs as well so so is there anything before i ask you where they can find you is there anything else that i have not asked you that you would have liked to have shared oh <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, I guess one thing I would like to say is that coming back to that unique fingerprint is yes. like maybe anybody who's listening, your journey is not going to look anything like mine. It's not going to look anything like Michael's journey. And I think what I'd like to finish with is to get curious about, well, what is your unique story going to be? Yeah. Story from the storyteller here. What's your yeah. unique story going to be? If you're going to write your own book, if you think ahead in time, if you're, let's say you're just beginning, what do you want? What's your story going to be in your book? Mm. You, you write your own chapters, you figure out, well, what's going to be fun or interesting for you? And what mm. do you need in order to get there? And for sure, in this day and age with all the internet, you know, you can, there's so many resources and not to think that you need to have it figured out all in one go, because for sure, my journey has been very much, I'm figuring it out as I go along, yeah. including, you know, like when I start, I started doing some interviews myself into my, my Facebook group. And then suddenly I have to figure out a few extra tricks to stream from zoom into but it, into the Facebook group, but it's doable. Everything yes. is available. So don't yeah. think that even if you are like Michael and I, single solopreneurs, you know, you can, you can reach out and get so many different ideas through people that inspire you. And they don't even have to be a big Tony Robbins or Oprah Winfrey. It could be like no. regular people like myself or, or Michael that have done things that you feel inspired by. Absolutely. Or people yeah. that live on your street. But to stay curious and stay open and then be willing, though, to do the work. And part of the work is an inner, it's an inside job. Yeah. Because when you're working with people, they will also feel your authenticity. So that inner work is also important. Love that. Thank you very much. So if people want to get in touch with you, I'll, I will obviously include it in the show notes, but where can they find you? What's the best place for them to go? Well, for the ladies who are listening, and sorry, gents, because my private Facebook group is for women only, and it's called the Evolving Women's Collective. And it's a very you know active, juicy place where not only I do teachings, but also I have, sometimes I have, like yesterday I had a guest speaker. So I bring a lot of content in there, but most importantly, I'm there every day. So you have direct access to me there. And I'm sending the ladies there because I'm in the middle of creating a new website. So I'm not sending anybody to any website right now. Okay. And in general, for the, for the gents, you know, look for me on Facebook with, with, my, with my full name and you'll find me there. And LinkedIn? 
I'm on LinkedIn. I have a YouTube channel. I I'm on Instagram. You know, I'm LinkedIn for sure. I am yeah. same name and I am also very active on LinkedIn. And that's where I found your podcast. That's right. That's right. Brilliant. OK, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your story. Super fascinating. Lovely to see you again. And if you do are when you're allowed to travel again and you do come to the UK, let me know and I'll make sure to get on a train so we can have lunch together. That would be lovely. And, up on and I would things. like to come to the UK sometime soon. You know, I still have a lot of family there and we recently had a, a, a significant death in the family. So it would be lovely oh. to see all of those wonderful people up north. Up north. <laughs> okay. Very good. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Pia. Really oh, appreciate it. Thank you, Michael, it. so much. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Bye for now. Bye-bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.